Uh, I've been uh, uh, teaching a class, uh, or was teaching a class at Roosevelt um, about eschatology. And eschatology is a big theological word that some people know way too much about and others know nothing about. And really what it was, I was just going through all of the different views that, that Orthodox Christians hold. Um, and what it means is we're looking at what happens in the end times, the last things. That's what eschatology means. And, you know, is, is there going to be great tribulation? Is the church going to be raptured out of here? Is the church going to go through tribulation? Is, the, is everything going to get better before Christ comes back? It, there's a lot of different views. Did, is, is revelation in the past, or is it all something for the future? Um, all of the prophecies in the New Testament we sort of wrestle with. And I'm going to tell you, I don't really come to a firm conclusion on any one position, so it sort of made it fun for me to uh, uh, go through the study. Um, but what sort of struck me is sort of how, what do you do with our morning's passage? the Great Commission? How do these different views handle it? And all of them handle it a little bit differently. Some elevate it, some sort of lessen it to some degree, put less importance on it, maybe change the importance of it. Um, But it is agreed that Jesus is sending his disciples to all nations to be his witness and proclaim the gospel so that the people from every tribe will come to a saving faith in Jesus. We all agree on that. It's not less than that. The question is, is there more to it than that? And that's sort of what I want to explore this morning, and I'm grateful that we get to do it together. So let's read. Again, I didn't have these the last time I was here, but let's read from Matthew 28. We'll do 16 and 20. This is called the Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in your word. And Lord, this is a a big passage. And as we gather here at a heavy time, Lord, there is is joy, there is sorrow. but Lord, in, in all of life, there is joy and sorrow, yet your, rem- your word remains constant. Lord, there are things swirling in each of our hearts right now that I do not know, but you do. So Lord, whatever good and true thing that is preached from your word this morning, let your spirit use it to, to edify, to build up, to encourage everyone in attendance this morning. We ask for this in Jesus' name, amen. So this past week, I am driving to work, and I'm listening to sports radio. I do that pretty frequently. And there, it was, I I think, Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't remember. But I don't know how many people follow sports, especially hockey. What happened was the Stanley Cup ended this past week. And the Florida Panthers were up three games to none. It looked like it was going to be a sweep. And then the Edmonton Oilers came back and won three games. So it was going, to, going into a game seven, this could be one of the great comebacks in sports history. The radio station, so that's sort of the setting of it, likes to do polls and said, what is the greatest comeback in history? And they posted on Twitter and on X, and, and some of the responses were the 2004 Red Sox beating the Yankees coming back 3-0 and then going on to the World Series, or Tom Brady's Patriots coming back from 27-3 to to win the Super Bowl against the Falcons. But what struck me in this was at the very end, they're like, oh, let me read one more. And the, the commenter said, I've got one. It's Jesus. Dead three days. And bam, he's alive. And all of the commentators were quiet. You don't hear this on radio. I couldn't believe that they read it, but they were quiet. 
And one of them, Dan Bickley, just goes, well, can't beat that. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. It is the greatest comeback story ever. Ever. And that is who the disciples are encountering when they hear the Great Commission. The man they just witnessed suffering the most brutal crucifixion they had ever seen. Their long-awaited Messiah was laid in a sealed tomb and is now before them giving them a mission. If you understand Matthew, uh, he is writing primarily to a Jewish audience that viewed the people and the nation of Israel as central to God's plan of redemption. They had been waiting for their promised king that would come and conquer their enemies. In Acts 1, in Luke's recording of this, this interaction, the disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? His answer is far more encompassing than they could have ever imagined. The greatest comeback in history wasn't going to end with the resurrection of Jesus as he ascended to heaven. It was just the beginning, the first fruits of the comeback, the first fruits of restoration and recreation, but not just for Israel, but for the fullness of God's creation, graciously centered on the crowning jewel of his creation, the human race. The disciples begin this encounter with a renewed hope of the anointed king of Israel to come face to face with the redeemer of life who took on the sins of his people and overcame death. You see that Matthew mentions that they worshipped him, but some doubted. But when doubt encounters the author and actor of the greatest story ever told, it crumbles with an encounter of the risen Christ. John tells of of when uh, Thomas, who was doubting Thomas, saw Jesus alive. And what did he do? He turned to Jesus and said, My Lord, my God. In a short time, a dead Messiah has become a living God and, has, uh, and our God has a mission for them and for us, all of us who follow Christ. A mission that may have sounded intimidating, maybe even impossible to a small group of faithful outcasts in Jerusalem or even in a gathering of believers on the outskirts of a desert city 2,000 years later. If those disciples could have seen us gathered at this moment, belief would have been easier. We have the benefit of seeing God working throughout history, Yet I'm guessing that many of us are still uncertain of our role in this task of the Great Commission. If only we could see the future. Remember the words to Jesus to Thomas. You believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. The Great Commission might be a little bit more familiar as we struggle with this than we actually think. Perhaps it's less daunting as we will go through it. But here, here is our confidence. The one giving this mission has overcome the impossible, and here is the foundation for it. Verse 18. And all authority, and Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So when Jesus says, he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. We may ask, didn't he already have authority? Matthew already put it on display in his gospel. Authority over creation, feeding 5,000, calming the storm, walking on water. He's demonstrated his authority over the law of God with statements like, you have heard it said, but I say to you, or, I have come to fulfill the law. And setting forth commandments that we call beatitudes, which are going to be essential to what the kingdom of God is going to look like. He shows he has authority over his enemies by casting out demons and causing them to tremble in his presence. By using the plot and schemes of the religious leaders of his day to actually bring about his plan of redemption. 
And having been judged by them, he becomes their judge. He has showed his authority over sin and its effects by healing sickness and disease and forgiveness of sins even before going to the cross. So is this the authority he was referring to, or was there more? The clue is in the word given. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And this is a clear reference to the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. I'll read it. I'm, I don't know if you guys have... I'm, I'm not a PowerPoint guy. So just hear Hear the word of God. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. One, like the Son of Man. It's a common name that Jesus gives him himself in the Gospels. He is coming to the Father, the Ancient of Days. He is given dominion, dominion, the power to rule, glory, and a kingdom. A kingdom that is not in the future. It has come already. If Jesus is saying all authority and has been given to me, and this is what's referring to, the kingdom has come. The, the kingdom is here now. One in which all people, every nation, including every language, language will serve him. The world has been given to him, and he is ruling and reigning now. There is not one person, not one ruler or power that is not sub subject to his dominion now. They may not believe. They may reject it and act in opposition to his way like any of us can under authority. But they will bend the knee at some point and confess that he is Lord and be subjected to his judgment. This is his world and his kingdom is to spread throughout the entire world. Right? We think of sometimes the Great Commission is go out and spread the gospel. And most of us think of it as, all right, I need to go out and evangelize and get people to come to faith. The gospel, according to Jesus, in Mark 1, is rejoice. The good news is the kingdom is at hand. The gospel is the kingdom of God is here. The gospel that we like to think about, which is also true, that we need to confess our sins, repent, put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, is the ticket into the kingdom. We all have to confess and put our faith and trust in Jesus but there is more to it than that. There is the coming into the kingdom and all of its riches. There is reward of, of, of giving your faith and life to Christ. There is being an heir to the kingdom, to being adopted as sons of God. There is so much to the gospel and the kingdom than just saying a prayer and going on with your life. The gospel, the kingdom is huge. It's all-encompassing and growing, and it's full of riches. And not only is the kingdom given to him by the Father through his perfect life, through the redemptive work on the cross, and through his defeat of death in resurrection, Jesus is also the creator of it all. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before 
all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. All things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. All things are created by him, through him, and for him. All things. He reigns over all. All things, and that should give us some indication of what the Great Commission is sending us to do. The world that has fallen into corruption, away from its original intent because of sin, is going to be set right as the kingdom of Christ grows and finds its completion when all of his enemies are finally defeated and he returns to conquer sin and death once and for all. And yet, while we wait, we who are in Christ, called under the authority of Jesus, to complete the mission of spreading the kingdom. This mission, this this idea of going and being called to do something should draw us back to the beginning. The beginning of creation, the beginning of the Bible. We see in the opening chapters the power and authority of God when he spoke and all of creation leapt into existence. And at the end of it, he said, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. What does that mean to be made in the image of God, right? It, there, there's a lot to it, but the simplest way is it being made. It, if you look in the mirror, what you see is a perfect reflection of yourself, but it is not yourself. It is something else. It is the mirror reflecting you. So too are we made in the image of God to reflect God in all of his glory and his goodness as we go about what he calls us to do. We are image bearers reflecting back to God who he is. We're meant to be representatives of God over his creation. Like Adam, Adam is called a son of God, being made in the image of God, called to reflect the glory of, and goodness of God to all of creation. Right? And this is, gives us this sense, and this is a term that is used throughout Scripture, a royal priesthood. Being the son of God, the king, meant to intercede for God. That's a royal priesthood. Israel's called it, the church has ultimately called it. That's what's happening at the beginning. We are meant to have rule over his creation and care for it as he would. It is in, this is what we call what is known as the creation, some call it the cultural, others call it the dominion mandate. In Genesis 1.28, right after he says he's made us in the image of God, he says, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. This command is prior to the fall, but it is repeated in different ways throughout the Bible. It's repeated to Noah after the flood. It's repeated to Moses. It's repeated in Psalm 8. And many view the Great Commission as the final iteration of the creation mandate. Humanity was to multiply and cover the earth, which seems like we've done a pretty good job of. Next, we are called to subdue the earth. And a, a better word than subdue, I think, is cultivate. Cultivate the earth. And cultivate has many different meanings to it. It can be done in an agricultural sense by tilling the ground. But the root of it can have equal meanings, like culture. As we cultivate, we also are creating culture. In subduing the earth, we are to make culture in all of its differing beauty. 
we also see that the word, the root of the word is cult. Not in the negative sense, but cult at its primary meaning is worship. To subdue the earth then is working to harvest the abundant riches of the earth, cultivating creative civilizations across the world, all while doing so as representatives of representatives representatives of God as an act of worship. Theologian G.K. Beale wrote this, God's ultimate goal in creation was to magnify his glory throughout the earth by means of his faithful image bearers inhabiting the world in obedience to the divine mandate. But we know what happened. Adam and Eve fell into sin and with it the rest of mankind and all of creation feel the effects of it and are drowning in it yet from the beginning god had a plan a remedy to remedy our condition the mandate has gone on cultures have been created and each has a semblance of god's good creation and all of them are corrupted by sin the earth is being cultivated but it is now difficult and we have abused our stewardship of it and multitudes have been fruitful in producing humans, yet each one of them separated from their God and Creator because of the sin in each of us. But we see this plan of redemption unfold throughout Scripture until we come to the finished work of Christ, who, as, as we heard, is ruler of all, reconciling all things to himself through the advancement of the gospel of his kingdom. We now find ourselves not just made in the image of God, but now we are new creations in Christ, and he has a renewed mandate for us. Look at 19, first part of 19, first part of 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and then 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Right Now that we have this foundation that all authority has been given to Jesus, a great confidence, and he is now giving us under his authority to go out. Let's look at the calling. Therefore, go. Israel, like Adam, as we said, was called a royal priesthood, meant to be a light to all the nations, but it was a fixed light in the midst of a dark world. And that darkness often snuffed out that light. But now the light is no longer fixed. It's a traveling light. We are not to just be light surrounded by darkness, but we are to take the light into the darkest recesses of God's creation. We are told to make disciples of all nations. And it, but here's what it actually reads. It reads, disciple the nations. The nations are to become followers of the reigning king. They are to serve the one true God. Yet it's done differently. As other kingdoms come by force, the kingdom of God comes through faith. So as we go out, we are to proclaim the good news of the kingdom And nations will turn from their wicked ways. And as Jesus put it, the mustard seed of the kingdom will grow into the largest tree of the garden. It doesn't always feel that way. It's a slow process. Yet there is more than strictly proclaiming the gospel. We are to disciple That means not to just say a prayer and go on your way. We are to be fruitful and multiply. And any good parent knows that you just don't bring forth life and say on your way. But you pour into all areas of the child's life, making them a disciple of your values. So it is as we make disciples, lifelong learners. We do it in our love for the Lord, we do it in our love for them. To teach them all that the Lord has commanded. All that we find in his word is what we are to teach them, which is profitable 
for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the disciple will be equipped for every good work. That last word, work, I think can, we can be content leaving it as good deeds, as though it makes us a good person. But if we tie it to our creation mandate, we see it as more encompassing. It is all of our actions, in our labors, personal or professional, in our relationships, whether public or private. And it is, it is in our interaction with the culture, seeking to glorify God and advance his kingdom. Israel was a light that was to show the beauty of God in all areas of life. And now we take the teachings of Jesus into all areas of life. In the family, to the state, in business, in commerce, to all areas of life. As Abraham Kuyper, a Dutch theologian and, and president, once said, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, mine. Now we've seen Christians get lost in this, th in this thought, especially when it comes to politics, and we should be cautious. While we have others who believe we should completely remove ourselves from this evil world and wait for the coming of Christ to burn it all up and start over. But I like how Herman Bavink, also another Dutch theologian, put it. The gospel of Christ, while averse to all revolution, it is all the more committed to reformation. It never militates against nature as such, but does join the battle always and everywhere in every area of life and into the most secret hiding places against sin and deception. And thus, it preaches principles by moral and spiritual, but not by revolutionary channels. They have their pervasive impact everywhere and reform and renew everything. The gospel and teaching of Christ will change the world. It will change the world. It's an optimistic hope and belief, but I believe in the power of the gospel. I believe in what Christ has commissioned us to do. He's not sending us on a fool's errand. He is going to accomplish his kingdom advancing throughout the world. Because it will never be destroyed, as we heard. Never. 19 second half of 19. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As we disciple them, we will grant them entrance, or they will be granted entrance into the kingdom and symbol, symbolized through the baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The one God in three persons, the Father of and author of the redemptive kingdom, adopts as children heirs to the kingdom. The son, the conquering king, who accomplished the establishment of the kingdom, washes us clean in his blood as we join in fellowship of his death and resurrection. And the Holy Spirit now is the power to see the advancement of the kingdom as he lives within us to make us holy members in the body of Christ. As Adam was given dominion over every living thing and called to name them, so now the, the second Adam has dominion over all creation and is calling his followers to baptize people all over the world into the one name. And they are declared citizens of the kingdom, united with God and their king. And the final, final words of Jesus in Matthew, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This once again should draw us back to the garden where God walked with Adam and Eve. They were in the presence of God as they were called to what they were created for. Yet sin separated them and they were kicked out of the garden and it wasn't until the establishment of the tabernacle in Israel that there was a cloudy picture of Eden where God would reside with his people. 
He resided in the holy of holies that separated him from the people stained by sin, where only the high priest could enter once a year to make intercession for his people. But at the cross, the veil of the holy of holies was separated, was torn in two that separated God from his children. No longer, no longer is God far off, but he now resides within us. Jesus can hear us, see us, and commune with us now. We are not alone in our mission. The Holy Spirit empowers us as we are no longer far from God. And and our King is with us, even as we may travel far off and proclaim His kingdom and make disciples. So what do we do with this now? What do we do with the Great Commission? We're commanded to go and make disciples of all nations. What does that look like? Are each of us called to take up roots and travel to foreign countries to be missionaries? Some of us may be called to do just that, but I'm certain that's not what we're all called to do. And that misunderstanding can sometimes paralyze us in living out the Great Commission. Right? Because we, right now, are amongst the nations that are being discipled. And we can be on mission right where we are. It can begin in the home by being fruitful and multiplying. Having children and training them up in the ways of Christ is probably the biggest way that a nation is discipled. Sadly, many children are abandoning the faith of their youth And we as parents need to do a better job of proclaiming, hear this, proclaiming the glorious goodness of Christ rather than just focusing on individual sin and proclaiming the evils of this world and culture. We need to point and to demonstrate something greater, right? I hear the complaint a lot from young people. It's always, they know exactly what we're against, but what are we for? What are we for? We're for a glorious kingdom, a righteous kingdom, one ruled by a right God who loves us and cares for us and knows what's best for us. Do they just see us complaining, longing to leave this world, or do they see us striving to make this world a better place, desiring to see the kingdom to grow? Let's disciple our children. What about in the church? Right? Many of us feel ill-equipped to evangelize and make disciples that we have made it the responsibility of a special group of people, the leaders of the church, primarily, primarily the elders. While they are wonderful at that, it is their task to equip you to go into your part of the world and make the kingdom known by teaching you and building you up with the whole counsel of God and participation in the sacraments. The church, the church is not a place for political rallies or replacement of entertainment. It is the place where we come to celebrate and participate in the greatest comeback in history and to bring more people into that victory. Does that mean that Christians shouldn't participate or take a stance on politics? Of course they should. Of course they should. Right? There is a difference between church and Christian. It's, sometimes that's hard to differentiate. The church, by its definition, right, the ecclesia, the assembly, the gathering together. But we as Christians go out and we have to interact with all spheres of life. And one of those spheres of life is politics and laws. And we should be engaged in that aspect of culture. And while some cultural and political issues need to be addressed, particularly in the church, as the Bible speaks to them, a church should not be defined by its allegiance to a politician or a party. Now, individual Christians, especially in our system, right, we live in a beautiful system where we are called to be a part of the government. If God institutes 
the government, and we are part of it, it is our duty to participate. And it might be as simple as just being knowledgeable and voting. Simple as that. But what do we do? We need to go out and promote just laws. Laws that reflect the kingdom of God. Laws that preserve life. Godly laws that are moral that are moral, and they lead to flourishing. Whether it's in the city or the state or the nation. Because if we don't participate in this part of culture making, someone else will. Let us disciple the nations even in the smallest ways we can, whether it's at a school uh, uh, council meeting, city council meeting, school district meeting. Be local. Stop worrying so much about who's running for president. A lot of that doesn't impact your life nearly, and those who, who you love, nearly as much as the local stuff that's happening around you. Get involved. Get to know the people that are involved. Disciple them. But one area where I know where we can all grow in discipling the nations is where we spend most of our time. Our jobs and where we spend our money. Where we are living out our creative purpose to subdue the earth and where we pay tribute to others who are doing the same. But as Paul writes in Colossians 3, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Whether you are a business owner, a stay-at-home mom, or an employee, you are first and foremost working for the Lord. Work hard, not cutting corners at your job. Be a master at your craft, wherever you are. Whether you're a sanitation worker or a politician, flipping burgers, selling flooring, or a doctor, excel at it. Be a master at your job. That brings glory to God. That puts the kingdom on display. And to the best of your ability, reward with your money businesses out there that are also promoting kingdom values. I know we're always looking to, be, to budget and find the cheapest way, but there are people out there, Christian businesses, but all sorts of businesses that are putting forth good values. Support them. Be a part of that. Let that be a part of kingdom flourishing as we support one another in commerce. We want our works and, to, and deeds to shine forth so God will be glorified and others will be blessed. These are all areas where we can disciple our nation and proclaim the gospel, fulfilling our part in the Great Commission. And the disciples must have had their doubts, even as they were being told by the risen king, that their timid attitudes, because they had timid attitudes until the day of Pentecost. And on Pentecost, they received power from the Holy Spirit. They had such conviction in spreading the gospel even unto death. Now, 2,000 years later, the Christian faith is the most influential in all of the world. I mean, we say it's the highest number of Christians in the world, uh, greater than any other faith. I don't know if that's true, that there are all Christians, but it's influential. The faith is influential throughout the world, coming from a small room in Jerusalem. It went out and has covered the globe and is, in, in, is inf influential in so many ways. God is powerful. His kingdom is growing. Let us hold fast to that because there is still much work to be done. Whether you believe everything is going to get worse, that this world is going to be burned up, that we will be caught up in a rapture, to avoid the worst of it, or if you believe everything is going to get better, I would not let those thoughts determine you following the king's commission, the advancement of his kingdom. May we be a royal priesthood and let him do, let him do with our works as he pleases. 
but let us be found faithful and long to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 